This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful gardening tips to help improve our environment. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mike Crew. Mike is uh, Programs Director for the Cape May Bird Observatory in Cape May, New Jersey. And he, um, he's got a great background, both in horticulture and also as a bird lover. Um, so Mike really can speak to um, both the flora and fauna aspects uh, today. Now, Mike has been writing some really interesting blogs over the last couple of years. He has a blog called View from the Cape. I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. And he's written some things about praying mantises. And Mike, I just want to first say hello and thank you. Welcome. Hi, Kim. Hello there. Thanks for having me on board. So, Mike, you've shared with me that there are some public misconceptions about praying mantises. Uh, tell us what those misconceptions are and how we need to get straight on praying mantises and whether they're good or bad. Um, I think the, the misconception essentially is that um, all praying mantises are good, that a praying mantis is a praying mantis is a praying mantis. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not born and brought up here, as you can probably tell by my accent, but I've lived here for a few years now and I'm, I'm trying to kind of fit in, get to, get to do things the local way. Um, but my understanding from what I hear from people is that, uh, most people think that praying mantises are protected, so you mustn't harm them. Um, and in fact, that's true when it comes to some species because there are native praying mantises in North America. However, um, there are also introduced praying mantises. Um, there's an awful lot of information out there on websites where people will tell you that um, praying mantises are good for your garden because they'll kill your pests. And really what I'm asking people to do is to question things that you read on the internet. Just ask yourself, how does that praying mantis know what I consider to be a pest? Because my pest might be somebody else's friend. It depends what you're mm -hmm. doing. It depends how you're gardening. Um, and that's kind of the starting point where I come from, I think. Okay. So from what I gather, there are only about 20 species of praying mantises that are native to North America. And I think the one that is native to your area in New Jersey is the uh, Carolina mantis. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. It, um, it's in the um, rather horribly named Stagmomantis genus, which is mm -hmm. quite different to the introduced ones. It's a little bit smaller than the introduced species. Um, it's a kind of a browny gray thing with a, with a dark mottling on it. Um, it's very widespread in North America, but it is declining. It's found throughout the eastern U.S., um, and we're probably just about on the northern edge of its range here. Mm -hmm. In, in New Jersey. I have to say, I have never actually seen one myself, although I'm out about a lot, I have never seen a native wow. um, Carolina mantis here. So whether they're here or not, I'm not quite sure. Okay. I guess if I go to Carolina or somewhere, maybe I'll You'll see. see them. I read that uh, they're actually the state insect of South Carolina. Indeed, yeah, <laughs> which is cool, you know. And, and the, the thing I have, the issue I have with all this mantis stuff is mantises are cool, you know. I mm -hmm. I love wildlife. I grew up with it right from a child. I've always loved it. But I think I also have a kind of head on my shoulders that says, you know, we have to kind of manage some of this stuff now. And we have to sometimes make difficult decisions that we might not like. But I think that we have to do that. We have to understand that um, we occasionally have to make these difficult decisions. And my issue really is with these introduced species, which are larger than the native one. And that essentially means that they eat bigger things. They mm -hmm. eat different things. Secondly, they have a very different way of feeding. It seems to me from what I read that the, um, the Carolina mantis actually has a habit of feeding rather surreptitiously, rather quietly, low down, um, in particular around bushy areas. The Asian species that have been introduced here, and, and there's one European one, mm -hmm. three introduced species in Cape May County here, um, they have a very different modus operandi. And what they do is they sit in flowery areas, they sit on the top of herbaceous plants, among the flowers, and they wait for things to come to the flowers. So think about that. Think about what that means. What are they feeding on? You know, they're feeding on pollinators. Right, right. Um, and um, in terms of, of dimensions, about how big would a Carolina mantis be versus, for example, um, the Chinese mantis? 
Okay, so the Carolina Mantis, from what I read, will get to probably about the biggest ones, maybe three to four inches long, which mm-hmm. is roughly the width of your hand. If you have your fingers together, look at the width of your hand. It's about the width of your hand. The Chinese Mantis and the uh, the narrow-winged Mantis, as it's called, will grow up to about six inches long, which is considerably bigger. Much bigger. Um, that's another couple of inches. Um, that's a much bigger insect. How about the European Mantis? How big does that get? That's about the, about four inches again, about okay. the same size as the native one. And I, I'm i sort of excluding that a little bit at the moment simply because it's not a much bigger insect. However, it is introduced, and this right. introduced thing is another aspect they haven't really talked about yet. But it's this idea that we can just introduce a species to an area where it didn't occur before we yes. did and that we then think that nothing's going to happen, that everything's going to remain the same. And guess what? Things change when you do that. Now, I'm in uh, New York, and I understand the European mantis was introduced here in the Northeast as a form of pest control um, quite a while ago. I think I read, you know, about 100 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. Um, So I take it that this part of the country in the Northeast, we really don't have a native mantis. Is that correct? I don't believe so. And I think that, um, I mean, I can take the European perspective because I know a bit more about that. Um, mantises don't occur further north in the Mediterranean region, essentially because the winters are just too cold for them and they, they just don't do well. And I would imagine that's the same here. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of hard to get the information because, to be honest, I've been online, I've looked at websites, and there's a lot of websites out there with misidentified pictures. Oh, I see. Um, so it's hard to know. Um, I have to say, so far, I have not seen a definite photo of a Carolina mantis taken north of Delaware. Okay. Uh, so I don't really know quite where they run out, but I think it's somewhere between you and me. All right. And um, in terms of the egg cases, I understand there's quite a bit of a difference in how the egg cases look. Could you describe that? Yeah, um, it's it's kind of hard to describe, but I'll try. The best okay. thing I can do is suggest people go to the website yes. and photos. But the, um, the Carolina mantis egg case is kind of a bit like a flattened football shape. So it's kind of a, an, an oval shape, sort of bulging in the middle. Um, and... Typically, it is a two-colored thing. It, it has like a kind of a palish stripe down the side of it. The, the very common introduced species that we have here is the Chinese mantis, and that's the one that's most often sold. And that has um, an egg case that's, that's very much kind of rounded. It's much more three-dimensional, um, equal-sided, and it's, it's, it's a little smaller than a golf ball. And it kind of looks like... Um, honey colored piece of styrofoam it's a kind of a a pale pale yellowy brown so kind of honey colored um and and kind of just looks like a little ball of styrofoam stuck to a plant stem okay um and are the uh, chinese mantises um kind of the worst of the bunch i mean if you're going to degrade them in in terms of their um uh unacceptability who's who's the worst mantis who's the best from the it's introduced the species simply because of size because it's so big and and i'm i'm saying when i say chinese mantis i'm now including two species okay which are very similar and in fact until recently were thought of as subspecies of the same species so they are very closely related the only way you can tell the adults apart when you see them in the field is that the um the one that they're calling the narrow winged mantis has an orange spot on the chest between the two front legs. That's the big legs that do the kind of praying posture. Um, The Chinese mantis has a pale yellow spot rather than a bright orange spot there. But apart from that, you would struggle to tell the difference in the field. But they're both big. They both get to six inches long, and they both eat large insects. Now, there's two particular problems with that when it comes to them eating larger things. One is they, I've mentioned that they like to feed on the top of flower heads. So they take pollinators, they take butterflies, they eat a lot of butterflies, they will eat monarchs, which is not only one of our largest butterflies, it's also a butterfly that as we all know, is not doing very Mm -hmm. well at the moment. 
And to be honest, I think the last thing we need is an introduced species that's uh, eating our monarchs when that species shouldn't even really be here. Um, the second thing which might come as a shock to people, and funnily enough, I was sent photographs of this just this last week. These mantises regularly do eat hummingbirds and that yes. is quite an extraordinary <laughs> thing to hear but they will sit on a hummingbird feeder and they will grab hummingbirds and they will actually kill the hummingbird eat some of it and uh, that's really not too cool I don't think I've seen photos of that and it's uh, pretty horrifying mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. hard to, hard for people to believe it, it, it is so the the back to the European mantis. Um, so is that a lesser evil? I guess so. Um, I, I, sometimes I'm a bit of a purist, and I'm thinking, well, I don't. It doesn't really belong here. Maybe we should tar it with the same brush. It doesn't get any bigger than the Carolina mantis, but there's maybe another aspect, which is that it might be out competing it. It's possible that. You know, the native mantis didn't have competition before. Now it does. And if the Carolina mantis is endangered, which it seems to be in some areas, at least, then the last it needs is competition. Yes. OK. And um, now the Carolina mantis, we would see you know, pretty much, I guess, in the southeast. And um, how far out does it go throughout the U.S.? Um, it actually goes pretty much right across, at least as far as the Rockies. I do okay. know that it occurs in Texas. Um, and a lot of these things, of course, that we think of as eastern, really east meets west way over in the Rockies. Right. There's nothing between here and there that's a major habitat change. So I a lot of these eastern things will go that far across. And then north to the to the mid-Atlantic where, where you are, basically. Yeah, and I would imagine in the uh, Midwest states, it's they're possibly going to get a little further north because maybe the summers are a bit warmer or something. They can survive. I, I would expect them to perhaps reach southern Pennsylvania, Ohio, and then a kind of a line more or less at that latitude. Mm-hmm. And are you familiar with any of the other species of the uh, 20 manises that are native to North America? I wouldn't say familiar. I have seen some. I, I have uh, I have visited Arizona, and I've seen some of the desert species there, which are really cool. They're much smaller. Some of them are only an inch or so long, and they actually have these little ground mantises, which, which live on the ground in rocky areas, and they hunt insects on the ground. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And um, any tips about um, releasing beneficial insects? Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, it's a tricky one. Um, I, I'm tempted to say that because then you don't have to think too much about it. If you have to think really hard about whether this is right to do or not, maybe it's best to not do it and kind of leave it to the experts. You know, there are some people who release non-native insects. Uh, for example, a, a classic example is purple loosestrife, uh, yes. an introduced plant that is becoming a problem. Um, Recently, um, various organizations under permit have been releasing introduced beetles that feed on purple loosestrife. Biocontrols. Exactly. And they won't completely get rid of the plant, of course, because if they did that, they would die out themselves. So no no insect is going to do that. But it seems that they they cause it to struggle enough such that it doesn't become such an invasive problem. It just kind of settles in to become part of the the environment as it were and i think that um if the powers that be shall we say if if major organizations make decisions to do that they've done the research they've done the study we as individual gardeners don't really have the time to study and research things before we decide is it good to let this go is it not good um can i believe what i'm reading on the web maybe i'll just leave it because um one of the things I think I, I, I touched on in one of my recent blog posts was things like this can become a problem. Insects can become a problem if you're growing a monoculture. If you're a farmer yes. growing, growing a big area of crops, you're growing one plant and you're creating an environment into which a, a potential pest species can become a serious pest because you've given it lots of food to eat. Mm-hmm. In, a, in a garden, in a normal size garden of let's say an acre or less, you know, right down to a kind of an urban size garden, 
people tend to grow a wonderful mixture of some of this, some of that. It's all in its place. It's like a kind of a, a mixture. And, you know, that's how things grow in the wild a lot of the time. And that's how a lid is kept on everything. You're going to get the odd pest on the odd plant, but it's not going to get out of control because there's not 500 of those plants. There's only the one. The population of the insect can't get as high. And I think, as I said in the blog post, the worst you're going to get is some holes in your leaves. That's pretty horrific if you're taking your plants to a, a show and trying to win prizes, um, and you might need to address that. But most of the time, nature sets the balance. Something mm -hmm. starts to get out of control, something else will come right. along. Because as that insect gets more common, its predator will become more prominent because, hey, there's more food for its predator. So eventually the predator controls it it disappears for a few years and then it comes back and so it goes round and around but it's all controlled naturally it's not somebody artificially pushing these things in year after year releasing these things releasing these things that's what causes the problem well i think that's terrific advice and um i certainly agree with it you know biodiverse gardens and landscapes are um, something we forgot forgotten about and we need to do more of and tolerating some damage to let nature sure. be in balance is really key um, there are lots of insects like caterpillars of butterflies that um, are chewing insects that we mm -hmm. actually want to support so uh, having that understanding is really important so thank you for sharing that no um, and um, I, I also saw this funny um, note that Connecticut has adopted the European mantis as its state insect. It seems uh, very odd somehow. I, I heard something about that. I guess the, uh, the official thing that I should say that everybody would always say in such situations is no comment. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so um, do you actually advise um, folks to thin out uh, mantids I mean, with a little education. What is your suggestion to people? Well, I do, yes. It's not a decision I take lightly. Um, you know, I'm a bit of an old softy. I don't go around killing animals willy-nilly. Um, I'm not an anti-hunter. Um, I think it's fine to go and take something to put it on the plate to feed the family. But, um, so, you know, these decisions have to be made sometimes. I think mantises are incredibly cool. You know, they're just such incredible insects, and I understand why people want them as pets, but they don't belong in the wider outdoors. So how do we deal with that? Well, they're so cool, I don't really want to be picking up mantises and doing them in. It's kind of like just feels a bit wrong. So what I'm suggesting people do is they learn how to identify the egg cases, which at the end of the day just look like a little piece of inert styrofoam, and that you remove those egg cases and you just quietly do away with them. Um, don't throw them in the trash can because they'll just simply get transported somewhere else. But um, the problem comes then with what to do with them. And I'm actually still trying different methods. What I've mostly been doing is pushing a spade into the ground to the full depth of the, of the spit of the spade and wiggle a little hole, drop them into the hole, and then just basically back heel the ground firmly. And I'm of the opinion that any little thing that might emerge from that egg is not going to be able to make it to the surface. And that the, the eggs will just quietly die, somewhat quietly, and it's kind of a little bit of out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. But it's easier to do than, than destroying the poor old adults, which are pretty cool things. Um, and, and it, it really ought to be relatively easy if we can get as many of those as possible to control numbers because mantises only live a year. All of the adults die at the end of the year. The females lay egg cases and they die. So they only overwinter as an egg case. If we can remove the egg cases, there's no adults around. There's none that have survived from the year before that are going to make it through. So it ought to be doable um, that we can thin these things out and we can start having a few more monarchs around again. Mm -hmm. um, and again, making sure that you're getting the right egg cases because we don't want to do in our native mantises. Absolutely, and that's where I would advise people to have a look at what I've posted. Um, 
If you go looking at other sites, I would advise looking at several sites and get a consensus because there are wrongly labeled photos. And I have to say, anyone who's followed my blog will know that I fell foul of that. I misidentified one of them originally. Now I've put the record straight. Okay. Um, because I fell foul of looking it up online as well. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> um, it happens. Somebody gave me a great quote the other day. They said, you can go on Google and you can... You can put in a question and you can get 10,000 answers straight away. You can go to a book and you can get the right answer. So, you know, the web is what it is. There's a lot of great information out there, but there's a lot of unresearched information. And it's very hard for most of us to know which is which. So right. be careful. Don't take advice from one site. Go to a number of sites and get a consensus. Make sure they match up. If you see photos, make sure it compares with what you're seeing on other sites. If you see anything that looks at odds, that looks kind of weird, maybe just kind of pull back from it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and question okay. it. Okay. That's I appreciate that. That's good advice. So, Mike, talk a little bit about the uh, the adult mantises and, and what they look like, their color, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point, Kim, because, again, there is a lot of misconception and misinformation about them out there. You will read a lot of books or, or maybe a lot of websites that tell you that species A is brown and species B is green, and it's not actually true. And, in fact, I have photographs of mating pairs of mantises where one of them is brown and one of them is green. Um, the color of a mantis is very variable. The, the Chinese ones can be green, but they can also be brown. So you cannot go by the color. The color doesn't tell you what species it is, and the color doesn't tell you what sex it is. It doesn't. It's not like green for females and brown for males. They vary a lot. It is, however, true that the native Carolina mantis is usually brown, grayish brown, and it's it's usually speckled, whereas the other ones are not. They're normally plain colored, and the Carolina mantis has a kind of a a sort of a mottled look to it. Oh, that's, that's helpful for ID. I appreciate that. And uh, one thing we haven't talked about, which I'm sure people are dying to know, is um, whether praying mantises are cannibalistic, whether they, you know, you know the, um, mm -hmm. the impression that um, females always kill their mates. So is that true, Mike? Um, it's not true that they always kill their mates. There's, you know, it, that's one of those wonderful sensationalist things. <laughs> like, oh yeah, the female always bites the head off the male. The problem is that praying mantises, like a lot of insects, they're not very bright by our standards. Although, as I always say to people, every animal on this planet is as intelligent as it needs to be to be that insect or to be that animal rather. Um, so the problem with insects is they're pretty small and therefore their brains are pretty small. Most of them are conditioned to do certain things. Praying mantises are conditioned to attack moving objects that might be food. Because if you don't grab it quick, it might grab you or you might miss your meal. The problem for male praying mantises is that they uh, obviously need to approach a female at least <laughs> at least once in their life and the female sees them as potential food. There's no real kind of elaborate courtship in praying mantises which would break down those boundaries such that they understood. So the male has to kind of get in there before the female sees him as a meal. It's kind of accidental. The female sees him as a meal. She doesn't understand what's going on. And more often than not, it's the head that comes off first. But nature is kind of kind of allowed for that in that the males can uh, stay alive for some period of time without a head. Um, basically, <laughs> basically finish their duties. So, how, how long? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't have an exact figure, but I would say it's somewhere in the order of like, 15 or 20 minutes or so. Wow. It's um, like a chicken. <laughs> yeah. Somebody might, somebody might say I'm wrong in that, but I, I I'm kind of guessing, but I think it's around that kind of figure. Hmm. Long enough. <laughs> that, that's, that's a great tidbit to wrap up with. <laughs> well, Mike, I, I thank you so much. Um, this is wonderful information and very important for folks to hear. Um, since you are the bird guy, I would really also like to interview you in the future um, about some bird topics, if you'd be willing. I see that yeah. cedar wax wings are something you've written recently about, which um, I adore. So Yeah, cool birds and, uh, and a great garden bird as well. Mm -hmm. They'll spread your your seeds for you. Well, thank you so much, my crew. And please, listeners, um, take a look at Mike's blog, View from the Cape, from the Cape May Bird Observatory in Cape May, New Jersey. Thanks so much, Mike.
Thanks, Kim. Bye bye. Bye. This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful gardening tips to improve our environment, please visit us at www.ecobeneficial.com. <music>